As they said, I am from the Allen Institute in Seattle. Uh, we, uh, what we do essentially is create gene atlases of brains. So we have atlases for mice and for macaque and for human. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But because it's atlases of the brain, I was asked to start off with some basic neuroanatomy, the understanding that a lot of people here come more from a math background or an informatics background as opposed to a neuroscience background. Uh, so we'll start off, um, I'll give you an introduction to the Allen Institute and sort of how we work and uh, what our goals are, and then a basic neuroanatomy tutorial essentially. And I apologize to those of you who do have degrees in biology, it's probably uh, basic enough that there won't be any new information for you. Um, and then the second session we'll move into actually uh, discussing the different atlases and the types of data that we have available for use. Um, all of our atlases are freely accessible. All of the data is freely accessible to the public. Um, and then we'll circle back around and uh, just a couple quick slides on some specific anatomy that would be helpful for using those atlases. And then in the afternoon, we'll do some walkthroughs uh, to look at uh, some of the main data modalities, how to grab that data out of the web. Um, and look at some visualization tools and talk very briefly about the API. So, all right. So the Allen Institute uh, for Brain Science is uh, an institute with a goal of understanding how the human brain works in health and disease. Uh, so we use a team science approach. It's not quite like academia. We don't have a PI that defines what the project is. The projects are defined as an institute, and the entire institute's goal is seeing those projects come to fruition. Um, we generate useful public resources, well, hopefully useful. Um, we drive uh, technological and analytical advances in the way that we display the data and use the data. And our hope is that uh, we can discover some fundamental brain properties uh, by integrating experiments, modeling, and theory. Um, we're independent, nonprofit medical research organizations. So we don't fund additional research. We do the research and we make it available for everybody else with the hopes that we can cut back on some of the experiments that you need to do as pilot research for your projects. Um, we're project focused and milestone driven. That means that uh, for each of the projects that we have, we have definitive milestones and times for data release that we must meet. Um, and again, an overriding goal of understanding the brain and health and disease. So why does this matter? Um, these are stats from America. I'm going to assume that the numbers aren't going to change too awfully much throughout the world. Um, but over one out of four percent of American adults have suffer from some sort of mental disorder, be depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism, um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the numbers are really astounding. So there are more than a thousand disorders of the brain and the nervous system. Uh, and they result in more hospitalizations than any other disease category. And yet we know uh, the least about the brain. So our goal is, is helping to understand how the brain functions so that uh, disease models can, can flourish. All right. Uh, so, ooh, goodness, should have checked the, the contrast. Um, we'll see how some of these pictures go. Uh, so. Our resources are used for advancing disease research in autism, Alzheimer's disease, epilepsy, obesity, multiple sclerosis. Um, as I said, we accelerate the development of promising new research tools. Uh, we do things in a high throughput way. So the work that you do at the bench, we do on a very large scale. Um, I want to say we are capable of processing uh, ISH slides on an average, if we were to look at our daily capacity, could be around 600 slides a day. So if we were running at full capacity. Um, and our resources also support classroom teaching. Um, and as I said, our goal is to help you guys 
uh, save time and resources by providing you data up front. Okay. Our overreaching goal is in understanding these things down at the right, consciousness, memory, behavior, thought, and how the brain works. And uh, much like Jim said, uh, looking, uh, starting with things like gene expression, electrophysiology, understanding the different cell types, the connections that they make, who talks to who in the brain that elicits consciousness, memory, and everything that makes us who we are. Yeah, we're really going to have to fix that. I, yeah, I don't think that it's going to be a light thing so much as it is. Yeah. And while they're working on that to get the pictures to work. Um, so we, uh, we like to say we use big science to tackle the big questions. Um, we look at development to find out how things come to be. Uh, we look at the parts, the genes, the proteins, the synapses um, of different functional areas to see what's going on. Uh, we want to know how things are connected, so we look at synapses or direct connections between cells. Um, and we want to know how the parts receive, store, and act on information. Um, and we also want to know what goes wrong in disease. So our uh, tools are designed to answer these questions either in part and specifically at one of these levels or at multiple levels for a given project. Um, what you can't see here <laughs> is a brain, and these are data points uh, showing gene expression um, in the human brain. So. Um, Hopefully we'll get that fixed or else the pictures for the rest of this talk are going to be a little not understandable. And so before I go any farther, um, our, our team is currently up to about 225 people that work at the Institute. Uh, this is a picture from last year. There was probably about 150 people at this time last year. So we're in a huge expansion mode as we introduce some new projects. Yeah, let's see. If, okay. Oh, yes, that's much better. Yeah, look, it's a brain. <laughs> we'll stick with this one. Okay, but, okay, you can probably. <laughs> so, so that's your introduction to the Allen Institute and what we do. Um, and we're going to hit, as I said, hit the atlases at the second session. Um, but to understand brain atlases, you need to understand a little bit about the brain. So we're going to take a, a basic neuroanatomy walkthrough. Now, I'll admit two things. I'm an anatomist, not a bioinformatic person. Um, and two, my focus is on the human brain. So although we do mouse brain stuff, a lot of this talk is going to be geared towards the human brain, as well as the second one, looking at more of the human experiments, mostly because that's what I work with on a daily basis, so I understand those tools a lot better. But um, some people like to think we're just big mice. I'm not sure if I quite fall for that. Uh, but it's going to be relatively uh, ubiquitous across. So the basic makeup of the brain um, involves a cerebrum, this large part here. At the back of the brain is a cerebellum. And then the third component that you can think of is the hind brain that consists primarily of midbrain pons and brain stem or medulla. Um, if you were to cut this, you would see that what we have is essentially a cortex or this ribbon of cells that surrounds the brain. And then we have a subcortical region filled with nuclei that sits deep in the brain. And separating these are white matter tracts um, running to and from all the different structures. Uh, so the mouse brain has about 75 million neurons, about 4 million of which are in the cortex, cerebral cortex, and 100 billion synapses. The human brain is at a completely different scale. And you're looking at about 85 to 100 billion neurons with 
around 100 trillion synapses to account for. So human brain, incredibly complex. And of course, we all want to understand how it works, right? Okay. In the mammal, organization is relatively conserved, at least as far as the sensory motor cortices go. So what you find is that the olfactory cortex is in the front. Uh, motor cortex tends to be towards the front, followed by a somatosensory cortex, a touch, pain, perception. Behind it, auditory cortex is off to the side, and in the very back is the visual cortex. Um, there's topographical organization to these cortices. So what you have here is the homunculus for the mouse. We have the sensory motor, or the sensory strip on this side, motor strip on this side, and as you come around the edge, what you see is that we have different areas devoted to different parts of the body. And for the human, we've got a large amount of our sensory cortex devoted to the face region and to the hand. And our motor strip, you have a similar mirrored uh, homunculus with a lot of space devoted to the face, especially the mouth, because we have to talk, as well as the hands, because we have a lot of fine motor skills with our hands. How this homunculus is set up is in parallel with those processes that we use a lot. So if you look at a mouse, a ghost bat, and a short-tailed possum, all of which have brains of roughly the same size, the mouse that gets most of its information through its whiskers and other uh, touch senses has an enlarged somatosensory cortex as compared to the visual and auditory cortex, whereas the ghost bat that uses echolocation has a much larger area devoted to the auditory cortex. And the short-tailed possum, which apparently has really good vision, or so I'm told, um, has much larger area devoted to the visual cortex. So our brains are designed to handle what it is that we do, or contrary to that, we do really well what our brain is specialized for. Whoops. There we go. Okay. For the human brain, there are essentially six lobes. Uh, we have a dividing central sulcus here, and in front of that is the frontal lobe. Uh, this contains that motor strip that we talked about. Behind it is the parietal lobe. And down at the bottom is the temporal lobe, and at the very back is the occipital lobe. These lobes fold over. And if you were to pry them apart, what you would see inside is called the insula. So there's a whole layer of cortex, and when you cut coronally, you can see the insula. And on the medial surface, there's this limbic lobe that's comprised of the cingulate gyrus and the parahippocampal gyrus, become very important in disease scenarios. Now, the bumps on the brain are called gyri. Singular is gyrus. The divots in between those are the sulci or a sulcus. And each one, um, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty of gross anatomy, all have a specific name. And you'll see that in the atlases of the macaque and the human where everything is defined by their location. So in the frontal lobe, you'll have a superior frontal gyrus, a middle frontal gyrus, and an inferior frontal gyrus, a superior temporal, a middle temporal, and an inferior temporal gyrus. So the name uh, gives you some indication of where you're at. All right. Now the cortex is made up of layers. So for those of you who focus on uh, more electrophysiology, you're well aware of this. Um, in general cortex, there are six layers. And what you see here is uh, Maureen Boyle has uh, overlaid and pseudo-colored gene expression uh, for genes that uh, primarily exist in a given layer. And so what you can see very exquisitely is how well layered the mouse cortex is. The human cortex does the same thing. I don't have any pretty pseudo-colored images of the human cortex, um, at least not healthy human cortex. Uh, but what you have here, here is our sulcus. And we have a relatively cell sparse layer one, a layer two that if you're used to looking at cortex, you might be able to make out. Layer three that's comprised primarily of pyramidal cells. Layer four, which is small and granular. And layers five and six, again, composed of uh, primarily pyramidal and multipolar cells. And each of these layers does relatively specific things. So layers three and five with the pyramidal cells are output layers. 
layer three, uh, you can think of as primarily sending output to other cortical areas, either ipsilateral or adjacent cortices or cortex that it's going to talk to. Layers two and four are essentially input layers. Layer four gets input from the thalamus for the most part. Layers five and six output back to the subcortex, either to the thalamus or down into the brainstem. And these cells all talk to each other in essentially a columnar fashion. So the cells here are going to mainly interact, or I won't say mainly, but have a lot of interactions with cells in the same column as compared to cells outside of the column. So there's a, a vast network in the cortex where it's just exquisitely organized. And I think when we talk about the visual cortex, you'll probably getting, be getting into a lot more of that. Okay, not all cortex is the same. Okay, just like all the areas are specialized, um, cortex is specialized. So here we have, essentially right from this part, a cut and we have the central sulcus coming right through here. What you can see is that this cortex up here, the primary somatosensory cortex, very different from the motor cortex down below. Okay, sensory cortex is going to have input from the thalamus so it has a well-defined layer four Whereas the motor cortex is sending information out to the rest of the body and parts of it are characterized by these incredibly large cells sitting in layer five. Those cells are sending axons all the way down to your tailbone to control leg movement. So that's pretty amazing for a single cell. So those guys are, are awfully big. And because the cortex looks different, people have spent a lot of time trying to parcelate out the cortex based on the arrangement of these cells. So over here you have uh, the most popular uh, cytoarchitectonic map done by Brodmann in 1909 and overlaid on it is a separate way of looking at the cortex which is by uh, high order function. So what you have in blue are the primary sensory motor cortex, yellow are unimodal association areas, the red or pink are high order association areas where a lot of thinking and computation goes on. And green is our limbic cortex, paralimbic regions that deal with emotion and memory types of things. Um, How variable is this match between people? Um, variable and not variable. So, uh, your motor cortex is almost always going to fall in front of your somatosensory cortex and it's always going to fall on roughly the same gyrus. Um, the division between those cytoarchitectonic areas can vary quite a bit. So um, the most variance that I've seen, we actually had a case, um, one of the most prototypical things is this division at the central sulcus where you have motor cortex on one bank and just as you come underneath the bend of the sulcus changes to primary somatosensory cortex. And we had a case that actually motor cortex came all the way up to the top of the postcentral gyrus where it had essentially pushed somatosensory way back. So um, there is quite a bit of variance and especially when you get into areas like prefrontal cortex or, or the higher order association areas, um, those borders can move around a bit but you're never going to find your areas 9 and 46 of the prefrontal cortex back in the occipital lobe. So um, the general pattern stays the same but there is variation and the same goes for the gyral structure of the human brain. Every brain is the same. Everyone's got a central sulcus unless you're diseased, a, a sylvian fissure that sets out your temporal cortex, but every single brain is going to look different. Um, and that's going to come into play when we talk about the atlases and the difference between doing a reference atlas for a mouse and how we have to deal with those discrepancies in the human. Okay. Um, the Brodmann map is not the only cytoarchitectonic map. There have been many cytoarchitectonic maps. And part of what makes them different is probably the fact that they all looked at different cases, um, but they also looked at different things and, and went to different levels. So up here we have the Brodmann map, and down here is von Economo, which is probably the second most used, and a lot of anatomists are pushing to go to uh, the von Economo map. Uh, Brodmann identified 52 areas, von Economo identified 107. Um, and again, 
not much difference as far as how organization goes. So a lot of it is a level of fine detail in what they were looking at. Um, you can also parse out by myeloarchitectonic. So you can look at the white matter tracks and how myelinated fibers are. This gives a very different pattern to the brain. Um, you can separate out by functional network. So you can organize by visual system and auditory system and high order functioning. Um, you can separate out by neurotransmitter networks. So all of this comes from a wonderful chapter that uh, Zillis and Amitz wrote in Nature. Um, Amitz and Zillis are working on uh, receptor autoradiography and using the, the different um, expression of receptors to further parcelate the brain. So they'll go into what someone typically thinks of as a single Brodmann area and separate this out into many more areas based on how the receptors populate it. Um, so as we move forward in time, we're getting finer and finer and finer details of what's going on in the cortex. Okay. Each of those regions has a specific function, but what really gives us the high level functions are the ability of the brain to talk to different regions. And so that's all, this is a diffusion tensor imaging of the human brain. Um, looks at white matter tracks in the directions that they go. So you can see this large track coming down here in blue, which is uh, the pyramidal track, goes from the motor cortex down to the spinal cord. Um, can make out the corpus callosum. Uh, all sorts of, of different tracks. So what our behaviors are have to do with our functions and our networks. Okay? And there's lots of networks in the brain some of which people talk about more often than others. Um, probably the most talked about is language. Um, involves auditory cortex so that we can process what we're hearing and a connection to motor cortex so that we can move our mouth and produce speech that is understood by people. And you can damage this area, you can damage this area, or you can damage the white matter connections in between and get what's called an aphasia where you either can't understand what's being said can't produce words that are understandable or a combination of that. Okay, whoops. There's a frontal parietal network that involves the ability for us to direct our attention either internally or externally to the world, right? So in frontotemporal dementias that damage the frontal part of this network, people look internally. They don't really much care about the external world. And you get some very strange behaviors like we had one woman who wore a cow outfit to work. and It was not Halloween. She saw nothing wrong with this. Right? So uh, when you damage these networks, uh, you start having behavioral issues. The most studied network is probably the visual system. And you're going to hear a lot about that later in the week. Uh, primary visual cortex is mostly on the medial surface of the brain, but it does come around uh, to this tail end here and spreads out and propagates across the brain. Um, so what we have are fibers coming from the eyes, going to the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus actually, and then coming back to the middle part of the brain. Uh, primary visual cortex or V1 then sends processes to V2, to V3, to V4, to area MT, to a variety of areas in what are essentially two different paths. The ventral path is the what path and is involved with identification of objects, naming objects, types of things. Uh, whereas the dorsal path is the where path. So again, this attentional uh, portion of that frontal parietal network, um, now we're getting attentional uh, where things are in space. gets more complex. This is a um, diagram from uh, Xuanjin Wang, who is now at the Institute, heading up our connectional atlas. Um, here's your primary visual cortex in the mouse. And these other areas are all V2. So they're all subdivisions of V2. And they talk back and forth to V1. They talk to each other. And it, in fact, this is essentially a network model of what's going on in the visual cortex, and it's not even at the finest level of, of intricacy here. This is considered a relatively moderate level. 
You've got your visual cortex down here and a variety of cortical regions, and you can see that there's a lot of crosstalk in those networks back and forth, not just within the visual system, but up to the frontal cortex of the frontal eye fields, um, to area 46 in the prefrontal gyrus, area 36 in the temporal lobe um, that's involved in integrating with the, the limbic system. So what's going on here in the brain is not a one-stop thing. What goes on here depends on what's going on elsewhere in the brain. Okay. Um, there is some lateralization in the human brain, most often talked about with language. So um, we just showed the language network going from the auditory or Wernicke's area to the, the motor frontal Broca's area. And anatomically, you see this lateralization as well. So this area of cortex will be, tends to be larger on the left and sit at a different angle. So the anatomy, the function go hand in hand. Um, but language is not just on the left hemisphere. Spoken language tends to be on the left hemisphere. On the opposite hemisphere tends to be non-spoken language in a very similar way. So in the back you have perception of things like facial expressions and emotional content of language. And in the front you have the production of these same things. So you can damage the right side, still be able to talk, but really not be able to know whether or not someone's coming up and telling you something humorous or whether they're serious or be able to interpret stuff like that. And like I said, the, the behavioral neuroanatomy of these networks follows along with disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, it's the medial temporal regions that control memory functions that are affected primarily and early on in the disease. Aphasia is the language system. You have disruption of that network between the uh, temporal parietal region and that frontal region. Uh, visual spatial disorders affect the regions of visual cortex back in the uh, occipital and parietal and inferior lobes. Attentional disorders. Um, ability to direct your attention throughout space as opposed to just one side um, shows up when you get damage to parietal lobes and frontal temporal dementias that generally affect the prefrontal regions and the same medial temporal regions of Alzheimer's disease can give you a wide range of behavioral problems from wearing cow suits to doing stuff like hiking up your skirt to fix your hose or something like that out in the middle of public you just don't really have this perception of the outside world watching you. It must be a big slide coming up. Do I go in back? Uh oh, it seems to have locked up. Let's see. All right, so that's the cortex. Um, but as I mentioned, we've got a subcortex too. And so I'm going to talk about the subcortex, mostly so that as you're going through the atlases and you're seeing these words, if you're not familiar with neuroanatomy, you're not completely lost. Um, subcortex sits, as I said, deep inside the cerebrum for the cerebral subcortex. And you can see it progress through. Um, and these are cells that are grouped into clusters called nuclei. And the nuclei themselves cluster to form larger structures. So you have the thalamus made up of multiple nuclei um, that do specific things, uh, hypothalamus, basal ganglia. And each of these nuclei are involved with different networks in the brain as well. Oops. All right. So we'll start off with the claustrum mostly because I would be remiss in skipping the claustrum or putting it anywhere else. Um, Christoph Kott, who is our uh, new chief science officer, has done a lot of work with Francis Crick in the realm of consciousness and understanding consciousness. And he works a lot with the claustrum. The claustrum is this sheet of cells that sits uh, between the basal ganglia, which we'll talk about next, and the cortex. It tends to run into cortex, and some people have wondered whether or not it's just a seventh layer of the insula. Um, it integrates various modalities. We think it's involved in consciousness. And what Christoph likes to talk most about are his Marilyn Monroe cells. The claustrum have these very interesting cells 
that will fire and respond to a single concept. So you can have a cell that will respond when you see a picture of Marilyn Monroe, when you think about a movie of Marilyn Monroe, when you hear a sound clip from Marilyn Monroe, but it won't respond for Michael Jackson or anyone else. You've got a different cell that responds for that. So each of these cells is very finely tuned and is integrating data from a lot of different modalities. Um, okay. Striatum and basal ganglia are pretty much some of the largest structures subcortically. The striatum consists of the caudate putamen, as well as the nucleus accumbens, which is considered the ventral striatum. Um, when you add in the globus pallidus, which sits in here, uh, you have the group of structures termed the basal ganglia. Sometimes the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra are included in that. And these guys are involved in, uh, there we go, quite a few different functions. So uh, striatum's involved in a motor loop, which is probably the most famous, as this is the loop that is affected in Parkinson's disease, so there's been a lot of work with that. Um, but it's also involved in an executive loop with the prefrontal cortex, so involved in executive functioning, day-to-day -day functioning of your life, um, as well as the limbic loop, so uh, involvement with emotion and memory formations. All right, the basal forebrain is this area sitting right in here. It consists of a couple really small nuclei, primarily cholinergic, and the cholinergic innervation of these nuclei go throughout the cerebral cortex. It helps modulate activity within the cerebral cortex, so it's involved in a lot of memory and learning processes. Um, it's one of the areas that is affected fairly early in Alzheimer's disease. And most of the therapeutics that are used right now for Alzheimer's disease that involve cholinesterase inhibitors are designed to counteract the fact that the cells that send out the acetylcholine are in the process of dying and not sending out quite as much as they used to. Um, so by altering the cholinesterase activity in the rest of the brain, um, you can keep the neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft a little bit longer until these cells die and then those medications don't work too well at all. All right. The thalamus is the other big one in the, in the cerebrum. Um, it is the relay station of the brain, and with the exception of olfaction, all of your sensory processes go first through the thalamus before being divvied out to the cortex. And the thalamus, as I said, is made up of quite a few smaller nuclei, and each of those nuclei have individual subdivisions themselves. But each of these nuclei receives specific input of a specific modality and send it out. Um, to help integrate stuff. Um, motor directions also go to the thalamus before being shuttled out to the body for a lot of things. All right, the hypothalamus sits uh, ventral to and anterior to the thalamus. Um, it's the other half of the diencephalon, which is actually comprised of four components rather than just two. Um, it links the nervous system to the endocrine system, or the pituitary gland, and so it's involved with a lot of metabolic processes. It uh, secretes our neurohormones. Uh, it helps regulate body temperature, hunger, thirst, circadian rhythms, sleep. Um, and it's interesting because there are nuclei in the hypothalamus that are sexually dimorphic, meaning that in males and females there will be different sizes or different densities of cells. Um, or nuclei that can fluctuate based on a variety of things. Um, hippocampus is technically, well, it's a cortical structure in my mind. There's always arguments about that. But people tend to talk about the hippocampus as an entity itself, so I'm going to cover it with the subcortical stuff, even though it's a continuation of, of the cerebral cortex. Um, it is involved in memory function, input and retrieval. Memories are not stored in the hippocampus per se. They need the hippocampus to get memories in. You need the hippocampus to get memories back out. Um, it's also the location of place cells, which are studied quite a bit. And these are cells that fire when you're in a distinct position. So they do a lot of studies in mice seeing where they fire when they're in a box. Um, 
there is this layer of dense granule cells called the dentate gyrus. And uh, it is involved in the hippocampus functioning, but also just underneath it in the subgranular layer of the dentate gyrus is where there is still some adult neurogenesis going on. Um, so there are new cells being born in the hippocampus. So a lot of studies going on uh, with that. The hippocampus itself is divided into four main sectors. CA1 standing for cornus ammonis or ammon's horn, uh, CA2, CA3, and CA4 that sits inside the dentate gyrus. Um, each of these sectors has multiple layers. Primarily, the largest of these layers is composed of pyramidal cells, so it's called the pyramidal cell layer, but there's also layers of fibers running through there. There are thinner layers, the stratum oriens. It contains very few cells and is essentially a layer that is a single cell thick. And then the final component of the hippocampal complex is the subiculum or the bed that the hippocampus sits on, and this is uh, transition cortex into enterhinal cortex and the rest of the neocortex of the brain. As soon as it goes, it stops. All right, and then finally, the last one we'll talk about, and this is not in any way a complete list of all the subcortical nuclei, uh, but the other big player tends to be the amygdala, which is uh, the sister component to the hippocampus of the core limbic system. And it's involved in processing memory of emotional reactions. It's been shown in mice to be important in fear conditioning. Um, so that's the cerebral subcortex. The cerebellum in the back, uh, I think we've got a couple lectures on the cerebellum as well this week. Um, it's located here at the base of the brain. And it, like the cerebrum, has a cortical and subcortical components. Um, it's involved in fine motor control, so timing, precision, coordination. Damage to the cerebellum um, tends to give you different motor syndromes compared to, say, Parkinson's disease, where you have a constant shake. Uh, damage to the cerebellum can give you uh, issues with being able to fine tune at the very end of grasping types of things. Um, while the cortex in the cerebrum is six layered for the most part, in the cerebellum you have three main layers. You have a cell sparse molecular layer, you have a layer of large bodied Purkinje cells that line up in a single layer, and then you have this very densely packed granule cell layer made up of granule cells. Um, the fact that this layer is so dense means that in the human brain of those 85 to 100 billion neurons, about 70 billion of them reside just in the cerebellum. Okay, so here we have a nissel. You can see the large Purkinje cells. This is an SMI32 stain, which stains uh, neurofilaments. These are actually some of the most beautiful cells in the brain. Um, you've probably all seen pictures of them without knowing it. Beautiful tree-like arbor. Um, subcortex contains three to four nuclei, depending on how you name them, uh, largest of which is the dentate nucleus. And these nuclei are involved in communication with the rest of the brain, sending out to the, to the cerebellum. Um, the brainstem and hindbrain, uh, there are different levels here. We've got midbrain pons and medulla. Um, it's where the cranial nerve nuclei live. So uh, there are 12 cranial nerves. With the exception of the first two, olfactory and the optic nerve, they all terminate back here in the hindbrain. So starting with the oculomotor all the way down to nerve 12. Um, they do integrative functions, so they're involved in cardiovascular control, respiratory control, alertness, awareness, consciousness, and damage to this is very bad for you when you can't have control of those functions. Uh, so it's a very important structure, and it's comprised of white matter tracts and individual nuclei, um, and there's quite a few of them. The only other thing to really touch on in preparation for the atlases 
is a bit of neurodevelopment because we do have developmental atlases that look at prenatal function. Um, developmentally, we start off with a neural groove. It folds into a neural tube. You've got an aller and a basal plate on that. And then you can think of this tube as becoming segmented from one end to the other. Um, and those segments go on to develop into different areas of the brain. And so essentially the prosomeric model is this segmentation and looking at how those different segments evolve during development. And so as you get farther along in development, those segments uh, can be parsed out finer and finer and finer until we have individual nuclei. Um, this is a little different than the way that we tend to talk about the adult brain. Um, Additionally, uh, because the cortex is still forming during development, um, we have structures that are considered transient structures, many of which go away either by birth or shortly after birth. Um, mainly the ventricular zone, which is where cells are born, and the ganglionic eminences, the medial and lateral ganglionic eminences. Um, these eminences uh, are the birthplace for cells that are going to go become the striatum and become cortical inner neurons, whereas the ventricular zone is essentially the birthplace for cortical neurons. And uh, those cells are going to migrate out and do what's called tangential migration around the cortex. And then they're going to change their path and do radial migration of astrocytic processes until they reach the cortex. And the cortex is born essentially in an inside out manner. So that first layer is formed, and then the sixth layer. And then as the cells are born, they layer in and push that sixth layer, to, sixth layer down. Uh, the result being that when you're looking at prenatal brains, we generally don't have a sixth layer cortex. Um, and so we have cortex layered differently. We start off with a ventricular zone. We've got a subventricular zone, which can be divided into an inner and outer zone intermediate zone. There's a lot of uh, trafficking of these cells as they migrate. There's a subplate zone where there's additional divisions going on. And the cortical plate, as the cells are moving up, differentiating and maturing. Um, to the very outside, we have a marginal zone and a subgranular zone. The marginal zone is likely to become layer one in the adult cortex. Um, Sorry, the previous one was in the middle of the of the previous one, the previous picture was in the middle of the pregnancy. Let me zoom back here. So this is, if I can. This one? Yeah. So what you're looking at in the next picture is essentially right here, OK? All right. So one of the questions that comes up, and I'll touch back on this again when we talk about the atlases, because there's so many different ways of organizing the brain, so many different ontologies, people always ask, why can't you just have a single ontology so that I can go into the mouse brain and then look at it in the human? Or why not just call the same thing in the developmental stuff? And this is essentially what ends up happening. There's about 14 competing standards, and someone comes along and says, well, that's ridiculous. We need to combine them all. And they make a system, and now there's 15 competing standards. Um, it's very, very difficult to get all these ontologies into a single entity, and there are attempts going on. Um, but especially when you throw that fourth dimension of time in there, and you start dealing with structures that will no longer exist in the adult brain, or you're looking at adult structures that just simply don't exist yet in the developmental brain, it becomes very, very difficult. Yes. Kind of related to this big picture question of how do we even approach this whole thing. This was throughout your very nice introduction. There was kind of like this tension between structure and function, right? And so there's a lot of description based on what different cell types do I see. And then there's a lot yeah. of based on, OK, if I knock out this part of the brain, it affects this capability. So I'm not in that area, but 
I have a sense that it, it's going more and more structural. Is that right? Um, you can tease apart more and more different. It's, it different really depends on which direction you're coming from, right? So uh, the clinicians will continue to see syndromes, which will indicate areas that are damaged. But if you're in looking at how cells themselves respond, then you have to really look at the different cell types and see who's connected to who, which informs back to the clinical picture and what's going on. So it really is a combination of both. And unfortunately, um, those two camps until very recently haven't discussed much, I so to speak. Fundamental problem like you had up the, the famous Vanessa thing of the visual cortex where it's like five bajillion uh, different areas with 50 million different yeah. things. And so I think there may not necessarily be a simple match of like structure to yeah, how it's, it's, function is going to um, And part of that is having to divide out function into cellular function and network function and behavior. Right, because those are all on three very different levels. And so even in talking to colleagues who, for instance, look at um, inner neurons in the cortex primarily, um, to them, if you alter the function of one inner neuron, now you've altered the circuit. Right? From a behavioral perspective, I'm not sure that one inner neuron being altered is sufficient to affect behavior in the long run, right? So there is this question of at, at what point do we hit that tipping point of individual cells being um, altered to the point that they're not functioning correctly before it affects the circuit as a whole. Um, so it is quite complicated. Um, and again, if you go back to the very beginning and, and where we're trying to get to in the end in the understanding of the brain, you really have to take those other 10 you know, things into account. Um, our initiatives in the future are moving towards more um, understanding how the cells connect to each other and the intracellular pathways that are going on in them. So we're kind of moving into the next step and the next phase uh, for us as well in helping with this understanding. Um, so hopefully within a couple of years, you know, the goal is to understand how every cell in the cortex works and who talks to who, and that's quite an endeavor, so. The, the timeline is, is uh, quite aggressive, I will say. <laughs> and <laughs> um, there's actually, if you want to find out more about uh, the future of that, um, I'm going to show you how to get to our YouTube channel. And there is the, uh, the press release and the press conference that was held as we started to get into this. And you can hear Christoph talk a little bit more about the objectives of this new program. Um, you know, in a few years in neuroscience doesn't necessarily mean two. So, uh, but hopefully a lot earlier than we had hoped. Just to press harder on this issue, don't you think that um, the Allen Institute is sort of uniquely situated to try to promulgate, uh, you know, one or a small set of standards? Yeah. Um, and, you know, many of us outside thought that some of the initial choices in nomenclature systems, for example, mm -hmm. were a bit idiosyncratic. Yeah. Um, but, but regardless, you know, be that as it may, it's, it's sort of analogous to the early day, days of the genome where there were, again, competing standards. And it's not like the annotation is finished and perfect right. even for genomes. Mm -hmm. But um, still, I think there's room for it to be a lot better. And so this slide is kind of, I, I find, too, you know, I mean, it's, it's OK for us to say that, but for you guys to say that, <laughs> it's not fair. Yeah, no. Um, you know, our first, uh, first thing that we are trying to address is not necessarily a universal ontology to use across everything, but ways to link them so that you can, there's more facility at moving between the different species and the different atlases. Um, it is not a small endeavor by any account. Um, but it is, is something that we have talked about and is kind of always in the back of our mind. Um, part of the problem is that for each of these projects, to do it 
to the best of that project's ability means that you need to take into account the limitations and structure the entire project around that. So for instance, with the human atlas, where there was a lot of talk about you know, how deep do we go and, and what ontologies do we use, what atlases do you use, we had lots of problems with this. There, there's no major standard atlas that everyone accepts for the human brain. Um, and yet, for each of the major structures, there are gold standards that people will point to. And so we tried to pull those gold standards in for each of the structures. Um, that doesn't include any sort of time reference. And when you move to the developmental atlases, since the focus is on time, you really need to address it in a time manner, um, which gives you a completely different ontology. So, yeah. Just, um, so we have a sort of, a, this is a great overview of the human brain. And we obviously know a lot, but there's also a lot of data that we don't yet have. Mm -hmm. So can you just maybe say a little bit more about, you know, over the next four or five years, the types of data that we expect to have? Yeah, and, and some of that's in, in the second okay. talk. So um, we are working on data for connectivity. For instance, we have a connectivity atlas that is in progress that will be looking at um, injection sites in, I think it's like up to 500 different spots in, in the mouse um, that you can then look and trace back to see exactly where all the projections go to. Um, that is going to go through the end of next year, I believe. And so that data is going to continue to come out for a while. Um, we are adding on fetal time points to our macaque developmental atlas, which right now is all postnatal, and there will be fetal time points to that. So kind of working with this developmental scheme and now being able to have a mouse development, a macaque development, a human development to move oh, between. That's, that's a, well, that'll, yeah. So that will be microarray, I believe. So again, looking at, at all the genes and the ability to get a comprehensive picture. Um, the new initiatives are more focused on uh, things like electrophysiology and mapping that back in to different cell types. So looking at firing patterns and individual connectivity and synapses and um, uh, finding a way to map that back to specific cell types. So in conjunction with our transgenics a lot um, to figure out how individual cells work and talk. So. That's quite labor intensive, and there's lots of other groups are doing that. So, how do you kind of pull that together with existing? <sighs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting to hear. Um, you know, we've all got ideas that that initiative is just getting underway. Um, and so, there is still a lot of discussion at this point on, on exactly which directions it's going to go and how we're going to be able to integrate a lot of different things. Um, there will be EM, there will be calcium signaling and stuff. So hopefully, and again, a lot of work with these transgen transgenics that have been developed so that um, we can look at very specific cell types that are highlighted by the transgenics to get a better understanding of individual cell properties. So fingers crossed. But yes, a very large initiative. They're looking at doing that uh, in the mouse visual cortex, as in mapping out all of V1 in that way. So. And hopefully I haven't uh, given away too much that's confidential. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that pretty much, and uh, now we're not too far behind now, but um, other questions about the anatomy? And again, we'll start diving into the atlases after the coffee break um, so you can see what kinds of data we have. Just a short question. You mentioned that when we have some damage in some part of the brain, we lose some functionality. So, but what is with the plasticity, for example? Is it possible that, I mean, what are the cases when some other part takes a role? Yeah, part of that uh, depends a little bit on development. So for instance, you can take a small child uh, that has epilepsy and needs a surgery to remove half the brain, and you would expect this child to not be able to move one side of their body. And they will develop into a fully functional individual if that surgery is done early enough. Later in age, when you start looking at stroke, that ability um, to reorganize is um, not nearly as strong. And so there are some studies that show 
that uh, with therapies, um, some of those areas that were affected, um, surrounding areas may start to take over some of the functions, but I don't think that that happens on a time scale that would necessarily get us to, for instance, recovery of stroke in old age type of thing. But there is a lot of plasticity that goes on, and it's very different to say change the plasticity between two cells that are connected to each other um, versus changing an entire network to do something else. So the plasticity is there. Um, the capacity changes as we age. It, it lessens somewhat as we age. Um, but uh, I don't know, if we were to live till we were 200, maybe we would be able to see some of that. But th there are functional imaging studies that, that look at um, shifts in function in, in surrounding tissue to strokes. And it does look like there is something that goes on there. Um, not quite clear what it is. 